So this is our annual clean rivers program steering committee meeting. Steering committee is basically anybody who's interested in what we're doing in the next river basin. We are the um, local clean rivers program partner with TCEQ in the upper portion of the next river basin. This is our agenda for the day. Uh, some of the presentations have gotten, uh, we've got different presenters for some of them because some people were out sick or something's gotten moved around. Oh, actually, everything's already updated. So from the agenda that you saw in the email, it's a little bit different. But the overall presentations are the same. So the Nature River Basin covers about 8,500 square miles. Amherst jurisdiction, ANRA is the Angelina Nature River Authority. Our jurisdiction is uh, basically the entire river basin with the exception of three counties that Lower Natchez Valley Authority has jurisdiction over um, down in the southern portion of the basin. For the Clean Rivers Program, we, um, we mostly operate from the San River down north. We think of ourselves, the River Authority, and three major divisions. We have our general administration division. Uh, this division is uh, coordination with governments and other entities. We do water resource planning and development and we do economic development through uh, condo bond issuance. Our field operations division operates a wastewater treatment plant, three water utilities, uh, and a compost facility in Jacksonville that takes uh, wastewater sludge from sewer treatment plants in that region in terms of the <coughs> compost that textile uses to see the size of roads or people can buy to do their gardens or yards. Our environmental division is our clean rivers program, our environmental laboratory, and we also do permitting and investigations of on-site sewage facilities in Angelina County and a portion of San Augustine County that's within the Nature's River Basin, which is about 90% of San Augustine. We also do, in our environmental division, we do clean rivers program related projects, which is a lot of what TWRI is going to talk about when they speak. So we have kind of adjacent projects to clean rivers program. So water quality related, but they're not part of the clean rivers program. And I'm going to step aside and let Renee tell you about the clean rivers program. Yeah, so I'll briefly, I guess, yeah, so I'm going to briefly go over the Texas Clean Rivers Program, the CRP. Uh, just going to read these bullet points really quick, just to get out of the way. Uh, you know, it was established in 1991. Uh, the purpose of the uh, Clean Rivers Program is to monitor the waters of the state and maintain and improve water quality. Um, historically, uh, the CRP program, we're going to do the CRP, <coughs> was uh, partially funded by fees of uh, wastewater discharge and water rights permits. Um, Jeremiah let me know that. Uh, it has changed a little bit, um, if that's correct. Yeah. Um, but it is still funded by the TCQ, and this is a collaborative effort with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and uh, 15 other partner agencies. And the emphasis on it is to collect water quality data for assessment and regulatory purposes. And to get more information, uh, you can follow that link below. Uh, this is uh, the budget allocations for the uh, program itself. It is shared amongst uh, different organizations, totaling to around $8.5 million. Uh, we do operate on a two-year basis, on a two-year commitment with TCEQ. Um, our total funds, if you see it, it's highlighted there, it's uh, $659,000, but that is split between ANRA and the LMBA. And the last update that we, uh, that we noticed was in 2014. And I think it was reduced from before then. Um, this is how we ourselves. We uh, categorize our budget. Uh, we categorize it by personnel salary. Uh, takes up a majority of the, uh, of the cost. Fringe benefits, travel, supplies, uh, equipment, contractual construction work, and other. Uh, other costs can include or do include uh, lab operations, buying supplies, our insurance, communication costs, things of that nature. Oh, and uh, this year we were fortunate enough to receive an additional $18,000 in funding 
this amount will be used for uh, supplies, well, not supplies, sorry, um, equipment. Uh, we are actually looking into getting a, a new saw, so a new uh, probe in order to uh, take more data measurements and increase our efficiency. Um, <clears throat> speaking of water quality monitoring, uh, we continue to monitor 37 sites every quarter uh, in the Upper Nations River Basin. We do have one 24-hour DO site, and that is located in Lufkin, Texas on Cedar Creek. This year, we're actually working on adding an additional site for 24-hour DO, and that will be in the riverine portion of, of uh, San River Reservoir. Uh, that is still under review and waiting for approval. Um, and the reason we're adding that one, historically, it's been known to have a, a DO uh, impairment. Uh, we have monitored there in the past, but we, I think what we concluded was that there wasn't enough data to really remove it off, remove it off of the impairment list. So that is a site we're hoping to add by the beginning of next fiscal year, uh, FY23. Uh, other agencies or entities uh, in the upper river basin that do monitoring include the TCQ, Region 5 in uh, Tyler, Texas, Region 10 in Beaumont. They do a total of 45 and 23 sites. I can't see your message. Sorry, hold on. <coughs> Should I see it? Jeremiah? Right, okay. uh, the MNBA, they monitor 26 sites. SFA currently monitors five uh, on their projects uh, tier. The Texas Institute of Applied Environmental Research, they do nine sites, and the Trinity River Authority, which is actually, they normally don't sample in a region, but they do uh, sample at Lake Palestine, since uh, the city of Dallas receives water from Lake Palestine. Uh, these, these are maps of our monitoring, monitoring locations. Um, they're very hard to see, but they're, we're, we're Looking into next fiscal year, there are going to be a few sites that are removed, and we are picking up a few. Um, I think this map is actually on our website if you want to look at it more in detail. So, what we monitor for, um, we do field parameters, we do dissolved oxygen, we look at the water temperature, flow severity, pH, the present weather, and days since last rainfall, second transparency, conductivity, total water depth. We also do conventional, conventional parameters that include ammonia, chloride, chlorophyll. I have TKM or total keto uh, nitrogen highlighted. That is a new parameter that we picked up last year and we're still continuing to monitor this year. Uh, that conventional parameter we still ship out to a different lab to analyze for us. Uh, we're working on a process right now to do it in-house and hopefully that'll save us a little bit of money as well. We uh, sample for nitrates, nitrides, biofine, sulfate, total phosphorus, and total suspended solids, and our bacteriological samples, including coli, as well. Uh, in general, historical and water quality data for the major river basin include impairments and concerns for the following parameters uh, elevated bacteria levels, uh, depressed dissolved oxygen, mercury and dioxide in animal fish tissue, and concerns for nutrient levels. And that is just the map, uh, the basin itself, and uh, the, most of the segments that we focus on. And uh, speaking of impaired sites, uh, the 2022, the Texas Integrator Report was recently approved by the EPA in July 7th, on, on July 7th of, of this year, as the 303D list of impaired waters. Unfortunately, we we have not removed any waters off of the list. We actually added more, and they're actually highlighted in yellow. So we add the Carrizo Bayou uh, for bacteria, West Creek for bacteria, and uh, interestingly enough, Sam Raver Reservoir and Lake Tyler, Lake Tyler East. Um, they, have they been on the impaired list? They have not, not for that. No, so, so they're actually added for a different parameter which is the excessive algal growth in the lake itself. Um, this is based off of uh, revisions, uh, based on the research that I looked at. This is based off of the revi revisions that were done on the Texas Surface Water Quality Standards back in 2014, I believe. Um, I could be wrong. 
but they, uh, they look at the nutrient levels of the water and uh, apparently they exceeded some, some thresholds and now they're adding to the list for algal growth. So those are the recent changes for this year. Uh, another thing I wanted to touch up on was the Basin, Basin Highlights Report. Uh, this is a report we do every year. It is produced annually, oh, it's right there. <laughs> By Anna, it typically provides an overview of previous year's events, ongoing programs, and the upper and middle portions of the, of the next river basin that are relevant to, relevant to Sierra Basin, sorry. Um, and essentially, it's used to address impaired water bodies in the basin that currently do not meet Texas Surface Water Quality Standards. This, in the, this is based on the 2020 report, so uh, next year's will probably be based off of the, the new one. So this year, we actually looked at the Piney Creek uh, segment, and that is located south of Lufkin, Texas. Um, I had some notes up here for myself. But the watershed itself, um, The watershed itself is uh, 236 square miles, I believe. I was trying to get the acreage on that, but so it's 367. I'm sorry. 367 uh, square miles. Let me look at that really quick. I have right here. 367 square miles. Uh, the watershed itself um, that is approximately 234,000 or 235,000 acres. Um, so, the, the Piney Creek watershed itself does have some impairments in it that are listed on the 303D list. And those are two graphs that I, or two tape graphs, sorry, that I pulled from the report. And this is from one monitoring station located at 358, and it's for dissolved oxygen and E. coli. Uh, the red bar on those charts are the standards or thresholds. And as you can see, uh, for dissolved oxygen, which is the top one, um, there is a, uh, uh, a decrease in DO levels over the years. And um, the E. coli chart, which is right in the bottom, they're, they're having several samples, multiple samples that are uh, above the 126 uh, CFU threshold. And that's uh, why we kind of decided to focus on that on this report. The way we kind of approach this, we, or I did, we, that was a collaboration. <laughs> we broke down the watershed into sub-watersheds and we looked at different stream segments that, uh, that add to the flow itself, to the Piney Creek uh, segment. Piney Creek actually discharges into the Nature's River Basin, just an FYI. So these are the, the sub-watersheds broken up on the bottom right the map there. We also looked at different flow measurements. Uh, we looked at hydrology. We looked at the land use, land cover of the area itself. Uh, one thing we kind of concluded was it was just a majority uh, rural area. So there's a lot of uh, farms, a lot of forests. So finding point source and non-point source pollution, uh, source of pollutions were, I guess, pretty straightforward. The only two sources that were really identified were the city of Oregon and Georgia Pacific. But I don't think Georgia Pacific would, or I don't think they're, they're permitted to discharge any bacteria. Uh, so any bacteria that would be discharged would be by the city of Oregon. Uh, there are obviously a lot more non-point source pollutions, uh, pollution, uh, which include agricultural, wildlife, urban runoff, and failing on-site sewage facilities, and potentially pet waste. And these are all potential, not, we're not, I'm not stating that these are all the sources, but uh, these could be probable. And that concludes the portion, well actually, this, this is included in CRP, which is education and outreach efforts. And like Jeremiah mentioned, this was something Ms. Kimberly, our communications director, was going to present. I'll let Jeremiah take that. Take this one. Yeah. We're going to see these slides together. Okay. I'll send it next year. <laughs> I think what Kimberly has in here for the presentation is just some photographs and some notes that she's giving. So one thing that we have done in the last three years, we actually started planning this right before uh, coronavirus came up, 
we have historically been less active on education and outreach stuff within CRP than we would like to be. And so we started making a big push a few years ago to, to try and do more education and outreach um, type events, going out to schools and doing classroom events, doing stream team training for volunteer monitors, that sort of thing. And Kimberly has been uh, a huge resource through her authority in doing that. She's been active with Master Naturalist with Stream Team. We've done stream cleanups in Nacogdoches and in Lufkin. We have done a bunch of classroom projects. I know Renee went out with Kimberly and did some full day uh, classroom events in Zawala last year. Um, Jacksonville. We've sponsored Jacksonville. I was the volleyball ball must have been something that she um, So we, we're proud of the work that she's been doing and she's been bringing Renee into that more and more. And so we're, uh, we're doing a bunch of stuff on that front and we're, we're pretty pleased about it. If you know anybody in a school that wants to uh, have us come in and do a classroom event for, uh, for students, or if you know a group of individuals that are interested in doing monitoring on their own, learning how to monitor, um, uh, getting involved, we call it the Texas Stream Team. It's a volunteer monitoring organization. We supply uh, monitoring kits to people and let them go out and collect data that we can then use to um, increase our awareness of what's going on in the watershed. So this particular thing right here, we updated our logo recently. You can see our old logo is the one at the top of the screen. All that we really did was refresh it a little bit, change the, the wave a little bit in the middle. We're also updating our website. We're in the process of doing that. Our website should get updated. Um, the one that we have now was put in place in about 2010. And it was great at the time. But it has not changed since then. And that was about the same time that iPhones came out. And so everybody thought mobile first now, and it doesn't work really well on an iPhone. So we're working on getting that fixed. Um, so that's what that slide's about. We have, uh, as I said, done much of stream team, and uh, we've also done some trainings with uh, Texas Riparian and Stream Ecosystem Evaluations. We did that in Tyler as part of one of our Clean Water Act projects that we partnered with TWRI on last fall, I think we did that. Um, and then the Texas Stream Team stuff, we have gone, we have Kimberly and Renee have both uh, gone to training events in San Marcos to become certified trainers. Kimberly is now a certified trainer and she can perform trainings here in the Nature's River Basin and I think Renee is very close to being finished with his to be able to do that training as well. We actually have a stream team training coming up on August 5th on Natchez River at uh, Highway 7. There's a, a new company out there that, that rents out uh, kayaks and uh, canoes and stuff. And so we kind of partnered with them. I rented some space from them to put on a training there right at the Natchez. And I think they're going to have uh, people kayaking and canoeing afterwards. So if you're interested in that, give us a holler. And, on the roster. It's a free event. The training is free. I think that you still would have to pay the, the community rental place if you wanted to go out afterwards. Uh, community partnerships. We sponsored a couple of um, fishing tournaments on the Natchez River to bring awareness to um, just recreation on the Natchez River mostly. We've also partnered with a bunch of uh, keep beautiful organizations, Keep Jasper Beautiful, Keep Jacksonville Beautiful, uh, Keep Nacogdoches. I think Kimberly actually is on the board of Keep, Nac Keep Nacogdoches Beautiful now, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, so huge increase in our community involvement through all of this. We're very proud of it. Um, stream cleanup days we've done. And we're also, we created a couple of coloring book activity books that we've been handing out to schools that are related to clean earth program activities and, and just stewardship of nature in general. I think we've handed out more than a thousand of those over the past two years. We've handed out um, 
other promotional products related to cleaner structure and camera. We have um, put up some signage at the swim beaches on uh, Sam River and Lake Ratcliffe, and we do swim beach monitoring at those sites. Um, we do them weekly and bi weekly throughout the swim season in the summer. And we have put up a bunch of signs about the alligator snapping turtle. Uh, we call it the AST awareness campaign. So I think that is yeah, promotional items, social media. Oh, she's actually she's been very active on our social media page. We have um, probably at least tripled, maybe quadrupled our social media post postings. We have a lot of people that see those posts and um, hopefully are learning something from them. We've put, we've done some promotional t-shirts um, and we're also working on, I think almost finished getting some um, of the old onion style bags, reusable bags that people can use for litter pickup on things like uh, canoe trips or fishing trips out on the river. We're gonna it out. And we've partnered with several organizations to collect those bags. So we'll have uh, pick up and drop off points for those bags. So if you're going to get on the river and go floating down the river and you want to grab one of those bags and pick up litter while you're out, then we'll collect it from you at the other end and uh, dispose of it properly instead of letting it float down the river. There's the alligator snapping turtle awareness campaign. So we put up these signs that you see in the lower left. We put them up at all of the locations that are dotted on this map. We put those up. Um, did we put those up? It's been almost a year ago now, I think. Like 20, sir? That's been, oh, it's been longer than a year. Time flies. <clears throat> so the signs went out in partnership with uh, us and Texas Parks and Wildlife with those signs up. We have taken in probably 20 different reports from the public of alligator snapping turtle sightings that we have. There's a database the state is using to keep track of those. We're at. We're also, um, Andy can probably talk more about um, the efforts to actually do some uh, tracking of them and habitat, not habitat, what's the word I'm looking for, um, range assessment of the snapping turtles. But that one has been pretty successful. We've gotten a bunch of good feedback from it and some uh, reports of sightings. They, it's not listed on any signs, but since this was put in place, they actually put some funding in place for Operation Game the to give, I believe it's a $5,000 reward if someone you know, comes forward with information about coaching or some related things about people in the kind of harming snapping drugs. Additional resources, we put this in every slide show. These are just links to the official Clean Earth page on the TCQ's website, um, the procedures that we use for monitoring our quality assurance plan. Um, and the list of monitoring sites that we do at the River of Cody, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, but you can also download those activity coloring books if you just want. We've had a couple of homeschool groups that have downloaded them and printed them out themselves. So, I think that's all we have from the River Authority. Also, I did a, on the PowerPoint. I did attach two links to the uh, to the guidance document for the uh, power bill assessment for the San River Reservoir and Lake Tyler. If you want to look at that, yes. So, so the power bill, the excessive algal growth thing for San River and Lake Tyler was basically coming about because TCEQ has updated their assessment methodology for that parameter. So it wasn't because something changed on the reservoir; it was because they're changing. It's something, I believe it's something that EPA has been wanting to do for a while and they were just coming up with a, a scientifically um, defensible way of doing it. And uh, they ended up assessing all of the reservoirs in the state and there were a bunch that got put on that list because of that methodology change. It's been a known issue, so it's not a new issue that's been happening. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <coughs> so, and that's my contact information. Uh, Jenny, you have to Send in the book. Yeah, I'll leave it back. Okay, no worries. So, oh, there you are. Yep. Keep sending those complaints.
<laughs> also, TCQ does a great job with that as well. Right? <laughs> us to Leo's presentation on the Kickapoo project. So let me see if I can. What was the message? Yeah. Stop presenting. Let's press start. Hi there. I've shared my screen. I think we're ready. We see it. We can okay. see it. You do? We can see your screen, but we don't see you. Oh, okay. I think I can only share one at a time. So the screen has uh, some better information on it than, than I do. <laughs> all right. Um, but uh, thank you all for letting me present virtually and um, be a part of the steering committee. I always love hearing about updates in the ANRA Basin. Um, and Kickapoo Creek is... Um, home to the Kickapoo Creek and Henderson County Watershed Protection Plan. Um, this is just a quick project update. Um, if I can figure out how to change my, there we go. Um, so we are partnering with um, the Angelina and Natchez River Authority for this Watershed Protection Plan. Uh, it is funded by the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. The WPP, um, well, I think most of y'all know some of this information. This was a presentation that we gave to our stakeholders uh, with just a little background information on kind of why we're here. Um, but the Federal Clean Water Act requires states to establish water quality standards and then achieve objectives and goals to meet those standards. Um, the states also are required to identify water bodies failing to meet these water quality standards. Uh, the list of impaired water bodies is known as the Texas 303D list developed by TCQ and Kickapoo Creek was placed on that list um, the, for the first time in, I believe it was 2008. Um, so being on that impaired water bodies list, um, it, it need, the bacteria environment needed to be addressed. Uh, TIER initially did that by performing a recreational use sustainability analysis in 2014. Findings were presented to TCQ and they determined that that recreational standard was appropriate for Kickapoo Creek. In 2021, uh, TIER and NRA completed a characterization project. The purpose of that project for Kickapoo Creek was to better assess and identify potential causes and sources of pollution. We did this through additional water quality monitoring. Um, I just called this project a fact finding project. We just saturated ourselves in data through water water quality monitoring, doing that monthly for I believe it was 24 months. That gave us some of the information um, to better uh, suit up or better prepare ourselves for um, what this watershed needed in terms of documentation, um, using that data to then uh, what, where on the water body, where do we need to focus, pay more attention to help it address and identify this cause of uh, the bacteria impairment. This is Kickapoo Creek. Can y'all see that okay? Yeah, looks good. Okay. These are our nine sites. Um, I'm going to try to point to them. These are our nine sites Here where the little yellow dots are. Um, we monitor there monthly. And through the WPP, we are continuing our monitoring. So um, actually, our guys just deployed ponds yesterday. At three sites on Kickapoo Creek, 
we have a um, 24 hour sun deployment where we are collecting in PO. Uh, dissolved oxygen is a impairment in this water body as well. Um, so that's our water we're looking at. And then just a little, it's a little easier to see here. These are not our station IDs, these are just our site uh, with road crossing. Um, so that if the map is hard to see, it's a little easier to visualize maybe where um, our sites are. Bolded in purple is where we conduct our 24 hour DO. Um, so, and I'll touch base on that in just a second. I want to show the last um, three months of our monitoring. All data is available after it's collected um, on our project website. And that website is at the very end of the presentation. You can copy that down. Um, but here is our data for April. Uh, you can see we had a couple areas of a couple sites with high flow, and then the sites with the lower flow had um, some elevated bacteria there. Um, May, this watershed I have, uh, we do trends, a trends report as part of our characterization project, and then we will also do that for our WPP uh, final watershed protection plan. Um, to me, they just look different every month. <laughs> Um, it's, it, to me, it's got a mind of its own, but um, you can see 21618 right here where that is now elevated. Um, I can go back last month, 21618, it was just right above that primary uh, recreation criteria right there. And then this was our June event. Um, we had one site that was pretty high, but also look at our flow. Our flow is um, has lessened um, because of the drought we're experiencing all across Texas, which brings me to an update for July. Um, as I mentioned, our field crew deployed uh, SONS yesterday, so they went to their three sites that they were to deploy. And, um, they were actually only able to deploy at two sites. Um, water was, was levels were too low to deploy at, I'm sorry, they were only able to deploy at one site, the most, our most lower site in Brownsboro. Um, water levels were too low to deploy at the upper two sites. Um, and so that means that for July, they're going out tomorrow to, uh, collect the water quality samples, and um, the upper two sites will likely not be able to be sampled because of lack of water to collect a sample from. Here. So um, that's the background of a watershed protection plan and an update on our monthly monitoring. Our goal in this project is to improve and restore um, and then longevity, maintain good water quality within Kickapoo Creek. Um, it, it's used as a tool for our stakeholders and for those within the watershed to leverage resources from local governments and state that will aid in the restoration and improving of that watershed. And lastly, these WPPs are voluntary and a proactive approach um, that is watershed wide to bring the stakeholders together and um, prioritize these best management practices to achieve our goal of improving and restoring the water quality within Pikachu Creek. Um, again, this just is a good visual of restoration being our main goal and how we're going to use, um, the, you know, our economics, our social, our environmental influences to get to achieve our goal of restoration.
Like I mentioned before, this presentation was given to our stakeholders at a stakeholder meeting. Um, so this slide was an example or is an example for our stakeholders of major tasks that we that we ask from them, um, how we want them involved, um, what we need and what we ask for of our stakeholders within the watershed. Um, I my goal is I mean everybody's goal that is a watershed coordinator is for our project to be stakeholder driven. And um, I'm having a hard time finding that a lot of times in, in Kickapoo. Um, my meetings in person can range from three people to 10 people. Um, and it's not, it's not always super consistent. So we've, we've tried virtual meetings, we've tried in, in person meetings, and I think uh, quite honest, we're at an in or we will need to recreate how we um, get to our stakeholders and get their involvement. So this is our outline of uh, specifically the Kickapoo Creek Watershed Protection Plan. Um, it'll be a 10 chapter plan, again, with the goal to improve and restore the water quality in Kickapoo Creek. These are the topics that we plan to address and discuss to achieve that goal. Our goal is to have a stakeholder meeting late summer, early fall. It's been kind of difficult to nail down a meeting date. Um, really for a lot of people in my schedule, but then I'm noticing a lot of people are on vacation and, and um, trying to get those last minute trips in or um, they're, they're just not available typically in the summer. Kids are at home, they've been home with them, what, whatever it may be. Um, so I am looking for possibly um, end of August through end of September sometime in there to look for a, a meeting. Chapters one through three are drafted and presented to stakeholders. Chapter four is in progress. Um, in chapters one through three, we are still working on updating a lot of our graphic information that uh, includes the most recent data um, from our water quality monitoring. So, um, and this is not on my presentation, but some good news. Um, in 2020, the Texas Integrated Report houses that 303 D list of impaired water bodies had a geo mean of 307.47 for Kickapoo Creek under the factory impairment for recreational use. And the 2020 report was just approved by EPA had that same geo mean down to 186.46. So there is some improvement in watershed and um, in, in terms of, you know, our data there. Um, so I am optimistic and positive, uh, staying positive for this one, for Kickapoo Creek. Um, this is our project website, kickapoocreekwpp.com. We have our monthly data posted. We have um, reports, drafts, and final. Oh, we don't have a final yet, but we will have final. The characterization report is posted. Uh, contact information and any upcoming meeting information is also there. So that's what I've got for you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Does anybody have any questions for Leah? All right. We will move to the next one. Then. I don't know how to see. There we go. All right, so next we got Michael Tram from Texas Water Resources Institute. 
He's going to talk about some of the Clean Water Act projects that we have going on. Okay. All right. Um, this is actually a good transition because uh, uh, we're working on a couple projects uh, in the watershed, Lanana Bayou and the Toyak Bayou. Uh, Lanana was actually, I guess, uh, probably about a year ahead in the timeline compared to Kitty Creek. Uh, the Toyak Bayou is a watershed protection plan that was approved uh, a few years back. So you'll kind of get a, a sampling of different stages of projects here. Um, so my name is Michael Tram. I'm with uh, Texas Water Resources Institute. We're at AM AgriLife Research and Extension in College Station. Um, for those of y'all that aren't familiar with us, the Water Resources Institute's uh, unit of AgriLife, and we're kind of tasked with working with different entities across the state on addressing water quality, water conservation issues, all across the board. Uh, I typically work on surface water quality stuff. Uh, and as a side note, uh, these first two projects that I'm talking about here, uh, Emily Monroe is our project manager on, on these, and would typically take the reins in, in doing this. So I haven't been involved in these projects. She wasn't able to make it today, so I'm uh, filling in. So I'm going to try my best to uh, uh, make sense of all of this. So, so uh, when Anna Bayou uh, flows through Nacogdoches, it's been on the pair uh, 303D list uh, since about 2000. And um, a report, a characterization report, much like uh, Ms. Taylor was talking about, was completed in 2019. Out of that, uh, the Water Resources Institute worked with the NRO and SFA to uh, develop a, a grant project to develop a watershed protection plan. Um, the, right now, I think uh, that project started, I want to say it started last September, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Emily's been leading the charge on uh, working with stakeholders, holding the meetings, drafting of the plan. Uh, she was also, I think she was on maternity leave between October and December, so there's been a couple different people working on this project. Um, so um, there is a link at the bottom if y'all are interested for that Lanana Bayou project. Um, right now, the project is, so Emily's, through those meetings, she's drafted up quite a few chapters. Uh, stakeholders have been able to review and approve uh, most of them. Right now, I know hopefully she's working on writing uh, six and seven. And so those are specifically in the watershed protection plan world, the management measures, those are the things that we want to voluntarily do. We want the stakeholders to take part in and implement measures that help reduce those equal levels in the, the water bodies um, and education and outreach. Uh, those, those are kind of built in management measures for the types of uh, things that stakeholders and agencies can do to help increase awareness about water bodies and, and water quality. So, uh, as I mentioned, she's working on drafting up those final two chapters. And so maybe this plan's been two years in the making? Certainly didn't start last year. Um, so the, she's uh, working on finishing up those last two chapters. She'll get that out to, to the coordination committee and the public in sometime this month. Um, and then it'll get submitted to TCEQ. So TCEQ is funding this project uh, and they'll do a review. Once TCEQ is uh, finished with the review, it gets uh, sent up to EPA. Uh, EPA Lately, their reviews on these watershed plans have been pretty quick, so usually they'll, they'll take about a month or two to review them. Um, when I first started working on these watershed protection plans, sometimes the review might take like a year or something. Like that. So it's been a lot faster. Um, so right now, what we is working on some uh, proposals that will leverage this watershed protection plan. One, one of the benefits to doing these watershed protection plans is that the watersheds that those plans are developed in uh, 
become eligible for what we call 319 grant funding. So the stakeholders can apply for uh, the SNAP point source pot of money to implement projects that are listed in those watershed protection plans. Doesn't mean we'll get the money to do it. Uh, there's a lot of watershed protection plans across the state, a lot of different people applying for funds, but um, that's kind of the threshold. You need that first before you get the funding. So Emily's working on putting together a proposal uh, that will be submitted this summer that hopefully once this plan is accepted, they'll be ready to start doing some implementation work. And so uh, that's focusing on outreach and education. Uh, and they're working uh, with, with the city as well as SFA on uh, specific, I think they want to do some specific EMP projects along the creek to help uh, control erosion and uh, uh, demonstrate some riparian protection projects. So. Hopefully that will be funded. Uh, the Toy Bayou project, on the other hand, uh, I believe that was, okay, that started back in 2009, and we worked with uh, uh, ANRA, SFA, and Pioneers RCD to help develop that plan. Um, and that was developed uh, through the Texas State Soil Water Conservation Board. That plan was, uh, honestly, it was submitted probably 2014 and was accepted by EPA in 2015. Since that time, um, there have been multiple kind of ongoing projects in the Toya Pine watershed. So this is basically two watersheds over uh, just to the east of Nacogdoches. Um, you know, working on those, those various projects, we've been working with ANR and SFA and Pine Woods RCD on those. Um, and then this year, they've been working with SFA on doing uh, monthly water quality data collection uh, at a lot of sites within the watershed. Uh, I believe that's going to be going on into the next fiscal year. Uh, there's also a septic system or OSSF remediation project. So one of the identified sources in that watershed protection plan for uh, elevated levels of E. coli or failing septic systems. So a lot of folks don't you know, they buy a house or they move into a house and they don't know that they need to get that septic system pump every few years. They don't know not to, you know, flush stuff down there that way. Uh, they clog up the system or will decompose. Um, or in real clay soil, sometimes the systems are prone to failure. So um, once, you know, that raw, untreated effluent gets to the surface, you travel to water bodies and cause all kinds of issues. So uh, these septic system projects kind of directly target a source you know, for folks that aren't able to afford a new ten or $12,000 septic system. This is uh, one way that we've been able to use that grant funding to uh, reduce the costs. Uh, Jeremiah, I believe this one, the, the homeowner puts up a certain amount and then it gets matched to what uh, They've set it up so that it can be either or it either pay for a partial or pay for whole. For the most part, everybody that's been applying has hit the property threshold, okay. and so they've been getting paid. Gotcha. I think there's only been, out of those 65 have been done, I think there's only been maybe three or partial. Okay. Well, this one's, yeah, this project's been going on for several years now, I believe, and so we've been able to keep getting funding through that 319 project uh, every few years to renew the project and uh, you're able to you know replace a, a ten or twelve thousand dollar septic system or something that probably otherwise would just have that effluent uh, going to the surface. So uh, right now it says 65 have been repaired or replaced and uh, right now I guess there's nine under some type of uh, contract or something and then 12 more are down the line. So. I think, uh, from my perspective, this project's been pretty successful as an outsider looking at it. So, uh, on these two projects, Emily's got uh, one final Lanano Watershed Protection Plan meeting in mid-August. I think that's going to be the wrap-up meeting to you know, finalize that plan and uh, get it off to the agencies. In support of some of these projects, we have some education events. One is going to be the Texas Watershed Stewards Program. This is kind of a general education program. Uh, Michael Pritu and the AgriLife Extension hosted. Uh, if you have 
ever been to one of his programs. It's actually really good at delivering a, some pretty dry matter that most people wouldn't be interested in. So I, I really encourage attending this one. We'll be delivering the Hall of Academosis. Uh, he talks about basically some of the stuff we're talking about today as far as water quality and regs, but also kind of the bigger picture of watershed management and how to get uh, more involved in it. The One Star Healthy Streams program is uh, target, targeted toward to, uh, ag producers and landowners and uh, basically provides a, a, it's usually a half day or a day long program uh, talking about how to better uh, manage livestock uh, to reduce impacts on water quality. So if, if you're a landowner that has a stream nearby or running through your property, uh, what do you need to do to minimize how much uh, fecal matter actually reaches the stream and uh, what are the different practices and programs available to you. There's also a component on there that talks about feral hogs, so what are effective ways of uh, feral hogs if you're not aware of of critters that uh, are working at taking over Texas, so um, they're, they are not wildlife, parts of the wildlife do not treat them like wildlife, so uh, you are free to take as many feral hogs as you want. Um, and we encourage people, extension encourages people not to shoot but travel, and so uh, there's a whole component about how to really effectively get them off the landscape without uh, really uh, spreading their, their effects. So that will be in spring 2023. Uh, the, the person that does that program, I believe she's on maternity leave right now, so narrowing down the date might be a few months from now. So, so contact information, Emily Monroe's our project manager on that. And of course, this program, all these projects have uh, been with uh, funding through TCEQ as well as the, as the State Soil Water Conservation Board. A uh, number of project partners have uh, sat in on meetings, provided input, uh, helped us secure locations, and everything else. So, uh, we appreciate all the local stakeholders because we come in from college and don't know anything that's required. So, so <clears throat> one more project before I get out of here. Uh, this one I know a little bit more about, but this is, uh, I call this our middle niches uh, project. So it's a little background. Uh, we just, so we've been talking about watershed protection plans, and we have talked, so watershed protection plan is a tool. It's one tool available for us to address water quality impairments. Um, Texans like it because it's voluntary. Uh, we can kind of put in what we want, and uh, you know, we can figure out our own path. Another tool that's available for us to address water quality impairments is uh, something called a total maximum daily load, or a TMDL. Uh, sometimes people, especially regulated folks that have permits for discharging water or storm water, hear TMDL. Sometimes they get freak out and get afraid a little bit. But uh, TMDL is just another tool to, to address water quality impairments. So I'll talk about it a little bit more here uh, um, in a, another slide. But to introduce you to these middle Natchez watersheds, these are uh, tributaries to um, Natchez River around the Lufkin area. So, going from, I guess, uh, east to west, we have Biloxi Creek that's kind of on the east side of Lufkin. Um, Cedar Creek is the major tributary to, to uh, the Natchez River. And then uh, one of the tributaries to Cedar Creek is Jack Creek. And then we also have Hurricane Creek. And so, the upper portions of Cedar Creek and Hurricane Creek uh, are, probably, are in Lufkin proper. And then we have some development starting to push out towards Jack Creek. <clears throat> um, I'm not 100% certain when these particular tributaries were added to the 303D list, but they've been impaired for a long time. Um, it's not like a new issue or anything like that. So, uh, this is the historical bacteria data for all of those creeks. And um, when TCEQ assesses water bodies for E. coli bacteria, they look at the seven years previous and take what's called the geometric mean, which is basically the average um, of all of the measurements taken in the previous seven years. And so if it is above 126, uh, what we call colony forming units, which is basically how many bacteria are in 100 milliliters of water, it'll be, it's considered impaired. 
so this red line kind of is a, uh, we call it a rolling geometric mean, but it's just the average over time. And so ideally, we'd like this red line to be below the spotted 126 CFD value. Uh, as you can see, for the most part, it, those, that line stays above our, our threshold. So the, those creeks have been impaired for a long time. Uh, one tool that we can use to address it that's available to the state is what's called the total maximum daily load. This is a requirement from the EPA through the Clean Water Act. And so when a uh, water body is on that uh, 303D list for a while, the state's required to do something about it. And so uh, the TMDL is one approach that they're allowed to do. Uh, essentially, it's an equation that says how much water is in the stream and how much load can that water body handle at any given time and still meet water quality standards. So you have to figure out how much water is in a water body at any given time. That part can get a little bit complicated, but the rest of it is fairly simple because you have a volume of water and then you have a level of concentration so you can figure out how many pounds or how many counts of bacteria that you can uh, safely assimilate into that water body. Uh, the TMDL goes a little bit further by uh, splitting up that total load into uh, different components. So we have one which is called a um, waste load allocation. That's going to be your uh, permitted discharges. So wastewater plants, permitted stormwater, things like that, that are permitted to discharge a certain amount of pollutant into a water body. Uh, you account for that into the equation and you subtract it from your total. And then you have what we call non permitted allocation. So that's going to be, uh, they call it load allocation here, but that's uh, your unregulated stuff, you know, uh, uh, runoff from somebody's yard or runoff from agriculture, which is it doesn't have a strong water permit. And so those can carry pollutants to your stream. You want to try to account for that too. And then we also have uh, something we call future growth. So we know Texas, you know, it seems like a billion people a day are moving to Texas. And so those, we need more wastewater plants that treat, you know, the waste from your body moving here. Uh, and then you may also have uh, growth associated with industry and things like that. So we try to uh, account for the growth over the next, you know, 30 to 50 years and build that into that equation. So at the end of the day, the TMDL is basically just an equation that says how much uh, you can, uh, how much Blue load that stream can handle, the water body can handle, and then how are we going to divvy it up between different sources? So that doesn't really tell us get anywhere, it just gives us the end number or target. Um, and the implementation plan is somewhat similar to a watershed protection plan. It goes along with that TMDL. Um, the difference with that I plan is it can include components that are not voluntary. Um, it can include something called control actions that for example, if a wastewater plant has a control action there, that's going to show up in their permit. So um, it's not fully voluntary, but a lot of the stuff in there is. So uh, basically, similar to a watershed protection plan, it'll outline the steps and the schedules for reducing those pollutant loads in the water body. It doesn't cover the whole range of stuff that a watershed protection plan does. Uh, watershed protection plan is more flexible. You can add more stuff to it. This is going to be just for the pollutant concern of the TMDL. Um, the process is similar though as far as working with stakeholders to develop and identify those management measures and control actions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in Texas, this anyone from anywhere else, this varies by state, but in Texas, the acronyms do not go up to EPA. So uh, this uh, TCQ reviews them and determines whether they're uh, meet the needs of that TMDL. So, uh, the, that middle meshes I plan or TMDL I plan project started just before COVID. Uh, so, it's challenging. That stakeholder process was very challenging. Uh, Anna Gitter uh, was project manager on that. And, uh, I applaud her because it was trying to schedule meetings. And we had to be really hadn't spent much time in the area. Um, Jeremiah helped us out a ton as far as reaching out with folks. But, uh, scheduling meetings during COVID and getting people engaged is very difficult. 
<laughs> especially when you have, have, haven't been able to get to work in full person. So, um, that TMDL process, basically, uh, the, the TMDL component uh, went to public comment in April. That will be officially adopted by the commission probably in August, uh, assuming no major hiccups. There will be a addendum, so Cedar Creek. So this is Cedar Creek uh, on the latest uh, 303 D list. This little component there got added to the list. So we'll have a, another report that will come out that will, this is basically just a technical report, and that will end up adding that as, uh, assessment unit to the TMDL. Uh, that one's not, a, doesn't require too much major work. Uh, the I plan was submitted to TCQ, I believe, in December, and that's currently under review. We've got, I think, one draft back from home to address the comments. Uh, once that, I'm going to assume that will probably uh, go to public comment next spring for approval in April, uh, assuming everything goes smoothly. Uh, we do have a website available for it. There hasn't been too much updated since the last stakeholder meetings last year. So, uh, middle of the that is that okay. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, going back to your, the step base replacement. Yes. 65 have been replaced. Have y'all seen a positive impact? Some way. We had one said so the lowest segment of the Atoyac value actually did come off of the impaired list for one assessment cycle. It actually ended up back on afterwards. We don't know exactly why that happened. It could be because there's more blue flow in the creek. It could be because TCQ does their assessment on that seven year rolling window. You end up with seven years of data and then the next assessment doesn't use that same data anymore to move forward. And so you could have an anomalous year where the, the pollutant load is higher because of a bunch of hogs or just more septic systems fail or whatever reason that bacteria is getting into the creek. And a lot of these are borderline. So when it came off the list, it was just barely in there and now maybe it's barely over. So it's just like hovering, kind of going on and off the list. We believe there's been a positive impact, even okay. if it's not showing up directly in the creek, uh, the overall, I say, in in, uh, because we're assessing a lot of uh, tributaries of the Toya, we may be seeing more positive improvements in those tributaries than we are by the time it gets all the way down to the Toya problem. Is there, and all these, uh, I'd say typically across the state, it's hard to ever point your finger at one. I mean, the character, I mean, fecal indicator bacteria by nature is pretty diffuse as far as the sources. I mean, it, we do let's call bacteria source tracking samples that we have projects across the state um, in both rural and urban watersheds. And most watersheds, wildlife accounts for a pretty substantial chunk, like 50% or more. Uh, you don't you don't necessarily want to do anything about wildlife. The wildlife is there, right? It's kind of a background source. Um, but then you have a little bit more when you account for people, maybe livestock and other things. Then that kind of gets you over. Uh, the, the threshold for the Clean Water Act. And so uh, we typically are concerned from a human health perspective, like, you know, what's dangerous to people. We are most concerned about uh, indicator bacteria that's because of human sources, because that's what's going to, uh, we measure people indicator bacteria because we can't cost effectively measure pathogens. So the stuff that actually gets us sick, you know, like uh, Giardina or or virus and things like that, but in the water from human waste, we just can't, you know, cost a billion dollars every time you go out to take samples. And so um, we use the indicator bacteria just to say there's some kind of fecal waste in the, the watershed, but it could be from all kinds of stuff. So um, from a health perspective, even if you're not getting off the list, addressing veteran septic systems has a positive health benefit for anyone that's recreating in the water body. Uh, same thing with livestock. Uh, cattle have kind of a higher uh, you know, risk of, of human health impacts, as well as uh, pets, like dogs and cats, which really high as well. So uh, usually we like to focus on the
notice. So even if you're not getting lots of this, you're reducing some kind of you know, health hazard. So how are you in public about this program? Uh, Sorry, can you We have, uh, basically at this point, we have as many applicants as we can afford to do anything about word of mouth is our primary. When we originally started the project back in 2014, the first iteration of this project, we were going door to door and knocking on doors and saying, do you know anybody that lives in this area that has a failing septic system that we can either give them some information about getting it repaired or potentially pay for part of the repair? And we struggled on that first project to get anybody because everybody's like, with the government, you're coming in here, you want to find me or something. And especially from the perspective of the river because we're the permitting authority. So we not only have, we're not only saying we can fix your septic system, but another department in the river authority is saying, hey, you need to fix your septic system or else you're going to get fined. And so when we got to the second project, number one, we had replaced a bunch of systems at that point. People were telling their neighbors and their friends, you know, this project is legitimate. It's not somebody coming in trying to trick you. And we also shifted some of that public education and outreach task to TWRI to the Heimel Tower CMD. Heimel Tower CMD has a history of doing the septic system related projects. And so they have a little bit of street grid, you could say, in the area. So we have the, the word of mouth from that and also having it come from a different face that wasn't the government. Uh, helped and so at this point we've basically got a backlog of applications that. So who's funding it? This is uh, a TCP. Right? So it's, this is a 319 project. Uh, as you mentioned, the backlog on it. We have one other septic system project down in the Matagorda Bay area. Money is a big thing. Like these grants are relatively small. Like uh, the total grant, you know, you might be able to out of a three hundred or four hundred thousand dollar project if you get like a big grant from TCEQ, most of them are like two hundred thousand dollars or so. So and once you put in some personal costs and then each septic system's you know running you twelve thousand, then you also have to pay someone to to design and install this you know there's there's a lot of other costs. It does that that money goes quick. And so it'd be great if there's a bigger pot of money. Do you need more money? I think everyone does. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, if it's you're having, if, you're, if you replace this many and you're not seeing a significant drop, can't you say, hey guys, we, we have more than we, we need more money because we have more needs? It's easy to have more money to develop. And so the, the 319 program, to give you a little perspective, is it's actually EPA funding and EPA uh, through the Allocations every year at the federal level has a chunk of money that they give out through the 319 program to every state. And so I think this, uh, the, that pot of money in Texas gets split up between the Soil Lord and TCEQ. And so typically, on, I think on an average year, they probably are giving out about $2 million in project funds. So, uh, Do you get any money from corporations or? Nonprofits or anything like that? Would, you, would, would that be something you Not very heard? often. We have, historically, we've had a few projects where we've gotten money from like the Yellow Temple and organizations like that, but they've become less active on that front. That was, that was probably back in the early 2000s. It's been a long time. It's possible that we could go out and try to advocate for that kind of funding from. Especially with the environmental thing as big as it is now. Yeah. I don't know that there's any corporations in the area, especially in the Atoya watershed, that are going to. The problem is that so much of these Texas is rural, and there's not a big corporation. If you were down in Houston or something like that, where there are a big bunch of corporations and it's an urbanized area, then there's a lot of places that you could go and say, hey, would you like to do this for the community and, and be able to do that? I don't know that you would find those sources. I'm not saying it's not possible. It, it could very well be that if you went out and you started asking around, you might get a small grant or something from a Walmart or somebody that had a... Well, I'm just asking, do you see a need for more money? Could, could more money... More money... Like, I don't want to throw money at a problem that's not going to fix the problem. It's chipping away at the problem, basically. I, don't, I, don't, I would say this. Reflect, you could probably replace all the subject systems in the watershed. You, 
I guess you probably still have an impairment. I suspect. Uh, because there's other things that contribute to it. Uh, but it probably make for a much healthier community. Uh, so I can speak into the funding thing too. The one other source that uh, some organizations are able to leverage are AgriLife and AM because they're really well suited for it, but uh, TCEQ does uh, through their permit program, there's something called supplemental environmental projects. And so basically when like a corporation like an Exxon or somebody gets fined for you know, uh, environmental violation, they can choose to put their money into uh, those fines. It's, that goes back to the community for, um, you know, like in the Houston area, HTAC, the regional uh, COG, they have a fund set up where they're able to use those funds to replace septic systems and stuff. Um, but again, depending on that also relies on having kind of a lot of permitted entities that are uh, violating their permits. <laughs> <laughs> they do try to keep that funding that comes from those SCP yeah. funds close to where yeah. the violation yeah. happened. So it's harder to get that money here. But we have one question do the counties pay uh, county enforcement, do they play any role in citing or finding these or helping mediate the issue? To some extent, they are, for, for a lot of the area, so for the HOF watershed in particular, there's basically four permitting entities that would be doing septic system complaints and permits. Uh, the Matters County does everything, and that's where the bulk of these systems that have been replaced have been doing the Matters County, because it's around the Sherino area. Most of the population of the HOF watershed is in Nacogdoches County. So part of the watershed is in San Augustine County, part of it's in Veracruz County, and um, part of it's in Sabine, I believe. But the bulk of the population is in Nacogdoches County. And so that's where most of the septic system replacements have been done. I think we've had maybe fewer than 10 in San Augustine County and maybe one in Veracruz County, if I remember correctly. So they are, they are. The, yes, yeah, it's a roundabout answer. The, the River Authority is the, we are the permitting authority for San Augustine County as a set earlier, and for those, we will respond in play. If somebody gets a complaint filed, we go out and find a septic system that's either non functional or it's just a straight pipe out in the woods, then we file a complaint against them with the local justice of the peace or whatever, whoever the local law enforcement is. And we will try to get that person information on how to fix the system or point them out the grant for and say, hey, if you go to Pine Woods RCMD, submit an application. If you're in the right uh, income bracket, you might be able to get some funding to fix this uh, if you can't afford to do it yourself. There are, of course, people that don't fit those criteria that still have some issue. They just don't want to fix it or, or they can't afford some other reason that's not financial and we can't necessarily help everybody. And it's... You it's, answered my question. <laughs> so, yeah. I appreciate it. Yep. Anything else? Right, thank you, Michael. We'll ask Duncan to come up now and talk about the project that we're just getting started with. It's just starting, so I won't have much project updates, but I will just introduce to you uh, what we are doing and what we plan to do. 
So uh, I will just talk a little about the, the bio, then I will explain a little about the water quality status for the Irish bio. Uh, Michael and the previous speaker talked about watershed best planning. I will give a little about it, and then I will talk about the current planning efforts. So the Irish bio. Uh, it starts, which, which is just a few steps from here. It starts about seven miles uh, north of the San Agustin city and then flows southwards to the San uh, Reban Reservoir. As it goes through this San Agustin county, it collects water from different tributaries. Uh, but uh, according to this picture, only You've heard about the three or three dairies that people have been talking about. Only the, the main stem of the Aish Bayou is in there. The, the, the segments uh, are not listed. Not that uh, we, uh, they meet water quality uh, standards. We, we don't know because they are actually not monitored. It's, uh, it's the Aish Bayou that is extensively monitored, so we are aware of its status. Um, the few graphs show the climate, uh, you know, the type of soils, and uh, essentially, based on the soils in this watershed, uh, uh, they are called class C and class D. Those, uh, according to SDA, those are soils with less infiltration and high runoff. So, <clears throat> what that means is if there's a lot of waste there, most of it will end up in the surface water instead of going to to the groundwater aquifers. Uh, the watershed, again, as you can see from the land cover map, it's larger rural with only one uh, major urban area, which is the city of San Augustine. And uh, as expected, most of the people live within and uh, around uh, the peripheral of the city. That's uh, for now briefly uh, what I can say about the bayou. And its watershed. Uh, the main stem of the Aish Bayou has been impaired. It was listed. It has been listed since the, uh, 2000. And, and as you can see from the on the extreme le left of the two graphs, uh, one is taken on the lower portion of the Aish Bayou, and the one is just you know it represents the water quality status of the Bayou just near here at uh, West Columbia Street. And at both portions, you see the, the dotted line is the standard, the 126 uh, CFU uh, that uh, uh, Michael was talking about. And at both two uh, portions, you can see the, uh, the, the, these other dots are the measured, uh, uh, measured sample values, and they are all, uh, and you notice again, it's not that the trend is going down, instead, the problem is increasing. So uh, one of the major reasons that uh, TCEQ uh, prioritized this, this value so that we can you know, engage people and propose man uh, management measures to make sure that uh, this trend changes. Because I mean, if you just say no action scenario, don't do anything, it will go up and up and up. And uh, if you don't do uh, anything, uh, usually waters with high levels of fecal bacteria and other pathogens uh, they lead to an increasing risk of especially gastrointestinal illnesses. So that's why we have to do something. Uh, usually for impaired waters, as uh, other previous speakers said, uh, most of the causes uh, can be human waste, if not which can enter into the water, you know, from Filling on site septic tanks, uh, sewer infrastructure failing, and that's where we, there are some of the measures really aim at rectifying that. And uh, again, they can be from the domesticated animals such as, you know, the, the, dog, the pets, the dogs, and the rest, uh, farm and wild animals such as the fellow homes, uh, whose waste, especially this watershed with high one of potential, ends up uh, reaching the surface the first surface water in this particular, the Irish Bayou. So, oh, usually when you get this problem, um, as I said, when it's infancy, we haven't uh, uh, 
decided whether we take the TMTL route, route or the, uh, <coughs> the, 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 the the watershed protection uh, uh, plan route. But all of them, they are, they are watershed based approaches because they look at the, water, the watershed as one entity. As, as Michael hinted about, the sources are usually diffuse, there are so many uh, non point sources, so sometimes it's hard to, to say that, okay, to pinpoint that the source is here, so that's why the, the bigger picture, looking at solving the, the problem from a bigger picture of the watershed, is encouraged. And uh, this process is stakeholder driven, uh, usually at the initial phase, you define the, pro the problem. Now, Someone will argue that we already know the Aish value is already there. So, what do you do in that phase? There are a couple of activities that you do, and uh, I will explain them on, on the next slide. But for now, we are still at defining the problem. Then, when we do that, uh, after that, we can, you know, with the local stakeholders, uh, especially who will come from this county, and uh, when we talked uh, with the Jeremiah. That was one of the uh, major basis of putting this workshop in uh, San Agustin County so that people from uh, uh, this, uh, this, this watershed, this county, come in. Then uh, after, you know, identifying the solutions and setting the goals, you implement measures like uh, what Michael was presenting about replacing uh, post SSFs, uh, those are kind of the measures. Then uh, you hinted about if changes are, are happening after you know, doing those measures, ideally we are supposed to measure success and see is the problem being solved, it's not being uh, solved, then can we redefine the problem? Could, could it be that we put the standard too high or do we need to uh, implement other measures? So the process, the process becomes cyclic until you achieve what you want. So that's basically what the watershed based planning approach is. And whether you take the TMD route or you take the watershed protection planning route, uh, at the end of the day, all of them are cycling. So, as I said in uh, the current phase, we are at phase one, where we are just starting, uh, finding the problem. And uh, to define the problem, okay, we know that the Aish value is impaired, but is it impaired during the dry month, is it that during the wet month? So uh, usually, uh, do we have enough data to define this problem? Because uh, like when Michael was talking about, you know, categorizing the different uh, <coughs> flow conditions and trying to know which road that you want to address, you have to find out, do we have enough data to correlate flows with the water quality status so that we can determine the roads in the water, those kind of things. So at this stage, that's what we are doing. And I would say, um, right now, we gathered the existing data and created a watershed inventory. Uh, the report, uh, we just submitted it to this, uh, uh, this month. During that ex exercise, we identified the data gaps. And uh, actually, uh, next year, we shall be collecting additional stream flow data, especially because the gauge we are depending on uh, is a flood gauge which usually has been monitoring flows during the, uh, the wet periods, so we lack uh, data during the, the, the dry periods, so uh, we are trying to, for, at least for the next year, to uh, collect additional data, then we shall do our additional analysis then with that we can be able to categorize that, okay, the problem is severe during dry conditions, the problem is severe during wet conditions, then after that we can estimate the loads during the different dry periods, the loads during the wet uh, periods, then after that we go to uh, phase two, which uh, now with local stakeholders we set goals and try and identify solutions and determine how much loads we can reduce by implementing those solutions. So uh, at this point now, what we should take from uh, this meeting is to stay engaged. As I said, uh, 
TWRR is working with ANRA and uh, uh, with funding from TCEQ about to, to monitor water quality, engage stakeholders, and evoke uh, uh, strategies. We've just opened uh, a website uh, when you click, when you go to irish.twri.town.edu, there will be a page of where you can sign. Uh, then you will be, whenever there is, uh, you know, we are coming to the watershed, whenever, whenever there is a training, whenever we shall always post those things, and then, so when you click there and you put that your email address, your contact, uh, we shall know, and you will be enter into an email list where we can always send you the info. Uh, the rest really is a few contacts if you can't access through the website uh, by phone. Uh, Dr. Lucas Gregory is not here, he's our associate director, but he's engaging with this project. Uh, we've been engaging with uh, Jeremiah, I think you already know the face is here. And uh, in case you need, you know, any more info, how can I participate in this project? Because for going forward, there will be a lot of stakeholder participation and engagement. Uh, you can contact these people, but any person really, as long as you know somebody, uh, NRA or TWR, you can always contact them and uh, they will give you more guidance on how to participate in this project. That, that's all I have for you. As I said, it's, uh, it's, it's infancy and uh, not much of it apart from this. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Does anybody have a question on it? Okay. All right. That leads us to our final presentation. <laughs> All right, well, my name is Andy Mullaney. I am a research associate at SFA, and today I'm going to be talking to you about one of the projects we've been working on for the past year or so, uh, which is looking at uh, repatriated uh, alligator snapping turtles into their uh, native river drainages in East Texas. So the alligator snapping turtle is the largest freshwater uh, turtle in North America, and it's found in a wide range of river and uh, stream systems throughout much of the southeastern United States. But despite the wide range of the species, uh, their pop its populations face uh, a lot of different threats, and we're, we're seeing a lot of population decreases throughout its range. And because of that, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is looking at potentially listing the species on the, uh, on the ESA as a threatened species, so not full on endangered but threatened. Um, uh, one of the major threats that the species faces is overharvest, both legally and illegally, uh, as well as incidental uh, fatalities that come from the species being bycatch on limb lines and trot lines that fishermen set out. Uh, now, the species is protected, the alligator salmon turtles are protected uh, from harvest in the state of Texas. However, in neighboring Louisiana, the species is, uh, it can be legally harvested, uh, one individual per vessel per day, I believe. So that sort of dichotomy between, um, you know, differences in regulations kind of can, has led to a lot of uh, population decreases in these areas that are kind of adjacent. Um, and we are still seeing a lot of illegal harvest of this species. Uh, with this research in particular, uh, the our U.S. Fish and Wildlife seized 30 adult alligator snapping turtles that have been poached from uh, their native river drainages in East Texas and have been brought illegally uh, across the border into Louisiana uh, to be sold uh, for both uh, you know, products as well as for food. Uh, those individuals were then brought to the National Fish Hatchery in uh, Nectish uh, um, Louisiana, where uh, they were initially going to be used for a, um, a captive breeding program for the species. However, in 2020, a collaborative effort between U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Texas Parks and Wildlife, SFA, and some other organizations, uh, they came together and wanted to look at how could they feasibly 
repatriate these individuals into their uh, native river drainages. And so really that's the main goal of our research. And in particular, we want to kind of quantify that, or, you know, understand that. And we're, we're trying to do that through uh, determining their post-repatriation movements and in, in, in understanding, you know, kind of how they're moving and where they're going. Uh, determining uh, what sort of microhabitat they're selecting for in their uh, uh, post-repatriation, and then also look at survivorship. But for this um, presentation in particular, we're just going to talk about those first two objectives there. And this is really important and why we're kind of looking at the efficacy of repatriation is because, especially with reptiles, uh, when you take individuals that have uh, been in captivity for you know, a prolonged period of time, re-release re or repatriation uh, efforts oftentimes are ineffective and you see uh, individuals usually dying off within the first year and so it's really important to do whatever you can, whatever we can to reduce that risk and, and uh, give these repatriated individuals the best chance they have to uh, sort of reestablish or establish themselves. And so we broke up our, this sort of, uh, you know, this research or this, this action into three sort of phases. An initial pre-release phase where indivi the individuals were uh, genetically analyzed to determine which river drainages they were from, and then we evaluated those particular drainages uh, both for um, the existing wild alligators and turtle populations, uh, and then also the habitat uh, at those drainages. Um, uh, then the release phase where individuals were assessed for health like in, in order to determine whether or not they could be released back into the wild and then fit it with uh, VHF transmitters and then released. And then finally our post-monitoring release phase, which is what we are in currently, uh, where we are monitoring the movement, um, microhabitat selection, and survivorship of these uh, repatriated individuals. So this initial pre-release phase, uh, we, we uh, cooperated with the Tangle Bank Conservancy and we sent uh, blood samples to them for genetic analysis, and we found that uh, we were able to determine the uh, river basin of origin for each of the individuals, which was represented by three different river basins throughout East Texas, namely the Natchez, Cypress, and Sabine river drainages. Uh, and then we went out to these drainages uh, and sampled alligator snapping turtle populations, uh, as well as the habitat in those areas to get a better understanding of what the demographics look like in those areas that we we're going to be releasing them in and what kind of habitat was available, available for them. Uh, <clears throat> during our release phase, prior to release, each individual uh, was assess uh, assessed by a veterinarian, uh, just had a general health assessment to uh, determine yes, we can or no, we cannot repatriate this particular individual. And we also recorded some morphometric and demographic uh, information on these individuals to kind of understand, you know, once we have them out in the wild, if we're seeing certain trends, would those trends be described or be like affected by any of that demographic information? Um, we then fitted uh, each of the um, individuals that were going to be repatriated with a VHF transmitter on the uh, marginal skew, on the back marginal skew, using bolts and epoxy. And then of those 30 uh, initial turtles, 23 were found to be uh, suitable for repatriation. And so they, they were taken to one of the Angelina Natchez Dam WMA, uh, Couch Mountain Ranch, and the North Toledo Bend WMA. Uh, now in this post-release phase, so that was in June of 2021, uh, after the individuals were released, we uh, got weekly fixes on the location of these turtles, and in each of those locations, we uh, collected microhabitat data, both at the individual's location as well as at a random point to see if they're actually differentially selecting for a particular microhabitat or if it's just it, no different than random. You know, they're taking whatever's available. Uh, and those, the microhabitat data we were collecting included you know, water data, water depth, temperature, that sort of thing, as well as, you know, different types of cover, stuff like that. So, here is some of the uh, sort of just basic results from our movement that we've seen so far. Here on the x-axis, you can see 
the, the week-to-week fixes that we're getting on these individuals. Um, and then on the y-axis, you can see average movement in meters. Um, and you, you can see initially, post-release, we have this high period of high movement where they're, they're moving around quite a bit that somewhat that calms down a little bit and reduces um, in the fall. And then in winter, really see, we don't see very much movement at all. We didn't really see uh, anything kind of moving around. But come the spring again, uh, we see another uptick in movement. So that initial uptick in movement uh, may have been partially due to uh, <clears throat> the you know post-release sort of trying to figure out the, this novel habitat. But we are we do see it again come the spring, likely due to individuals looking for mates and other breeding behaviors, stuff like that. And you can see on that left-hand side there that it was at two of our sites, but our third site, uh, the Couch Mountain Ranch site, we don't really see that uptick um, in uh, movement. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later. But part of that that sort of spring uptick in movement again, we can see with this turtle here that was in the uh, prior location for the individual was down here below the confluence of the Angelina and the Natchez. And it was uh, its next, uh, the next time we got a lock on the individual was 22, over 22 miles up the Natchez River. And it had been, we found out where it was because it had been caught on a trot line by a fisherman. And fortunately, the fisherman called us, they didn't you know, kill the individual or anything like that, and so we were able to go get that. So they're, they're moving quite a bit, even, even now. Um, so here is uh, our, the results from our microhabitat data, and this is a uh, multivariate uh, analysis or a graph of our, uh, some multivariate analysis. And really the main takeaway here is that those, uh, and it's, it's uh, taking all of our microhabitat data together, so the variation of all of that. And you can see here that uh, the at points at of the individual turtles are separate from those random points, indicating that they are more than more likely than not uh, differentially selected for a particular habitat. And <clears throat> in particular, they're avoiding the deeper waters, so this is specifically on our Angelina Nature site. Um, they're avoiding deeper waters and uh, going more towards this, what we were kind of calling the sweet spot in depth of about a meter to two meters uh, in depth and looking for areas with a lot of wood cover in the bottom left hand side along the river edge with undercuts um, and then on the upper left hand side it are the individuals that are selected more for those oxbow lakes and uh, little uh, wetlands and stuff like that that are along the river that uh, have a lower flow rate or no flow rate, uh, but an increase of, um, of vegetation, uh, herbaceous vegetation specifically. But for the most part, we're seeing similar sort of selection in terms of depth, which likely has to do with temperature and trying to, uh, the individuals trying to thermoregulate and finding uh, that sort of sweet spot for that. And we see a similar selection in our Couch Mountain Ranch site, um, just with the cypress being uh, shallower and, and not nearly as, as, as wide uh, where, where we're doing our sampling there. Uh, they're actually selecting for deeper water than the ranging points, but we're still seeing a similar depth, looking for uh, these undercuts and the increase in uh, woody debris and cover and stuff. We don't really see any sort of selection at North Toledo Bend, but likely the reason for that is that most of the turtles are located within uh, those oxbow lakes around the Sabine, um, and they're almost completely covered by Salvinia, and so it's, it's, very, it's a very um, <clears throat> uh, homogenous environment. We really don't see a lot of differences, at least in the aquatic environment, and it's really hard to kind of um, at, at a more gross level, uh, get a good idea of like how those are really differing. Um, likely, though, temperature is still a, a major driver, I would assume, with, with, uh, with that. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of these results uh, kind of go along with uh, prior research into wild alligator snapping turtles and their 
uh, movements and habitat selection. Um, previous studies in, in, in and around Houston found, specifically in the Buffalo Bayou, found that alligator snapping turtles decrease uh, their you know, movements in those periods of, of extreme temperatures, hot and cold. Um, and we you know, kind of expect to see that initial spike in movement uh, post-release, but it was all pretty similar across the board. And those movements are where we saw kind of differences in uh, movement, namely this past spring where we had two sites where we did see an uptick in movements from individuals and one where there wasn't. That's likely due to the fact that at the Couch Mountain Ranch uh, site where we didn't see that in, in, uh, uptick in movement, uh, those individuals are mostly sub-adults and likely aren't breeding or aren't like, you know, going through those sort of behaviors to be ready for nesting, that sort of thing, or look for mates and those. So that's likely why we're seeing that. Uh, it might not be, but that's, that's what we assume. Um, <clears throat> and obviously temperature is a big part of all of that. Um, and then we all, you know, we want to look at survivorship of these individuals and see if, if this is, is feasible and they are kind of, they can, we're not seeing a mass die out and it's, you know, normal to what we see in survivorship curves for wild alligator snapping turtles. Um, and our results indicate that this is, could potentially be a, a good uh, conservation tool, you know, when, when you do have individuals that have been taken out of these, the, their native drainages and stuff like that. Uh, because with, you know, a removal of even 2% of the females in, in a alligator snapping turtle population can be detrimental, at, detrimental to the population at large. So, and the majority of the individuals that we repatriated were females. So, you know, the, in a lot of times it seems like that they're the ones that are being captured. And so that could potentially be a, uh, you know, a boon for, you know, kind of shoring up native wild populations. And in the future, I say in the future, we're doing this now, we're working on this right now, but um, we are also at the Angelina Nature's Day on WMA, we are going to be capturing uh, wild alligator snapping turtles, uh, five males and five females, and then another two females uh, that will be putting uh, GPS tags on as opposed to VHF tags. Um, and with the GPS tags, we're really just looking at is, can we do that effectively? If, uh, you know, are they not, even though they're going into this deep water, can we still kind of get, and don't really surface all that often, can we still get, you know, somewhat accurate and uh, reliable information on their locations? Because what, what we are doing right now, what Sophie and I are doing right now, is very labor intensive, going out and getting locations, you know, once, twice a week at each site. And so, if we can do it with GPS tags, I mean, we'd be out of a job, but otherwise it would be, it'd be a net positive. Um, so hopefully if someone wants to, we, we can find funding for more GPS tags if it's successful. Um, but the big deal with capturing or getting those wild turtles is to have a comparison at the same site and see, uh, maybe, maybe we're seeing similar movements to other studies in other states or in other time periods, but within similar, you know, attempt, you know, temporal and locational scale, are we seeing, you know, similar trends with the wild and repatriated individuals? And so that's what we're kind of working on right now. And with that, I want to, there are a lot of different people, organizations, and uh, you know, funding sources that I want to thank. And they're all they're all right here. Um, and there there's been a lot of a lot of people uh, helping out with all this. And with that, I will answer any questions anyone has. You can email me any questions if you'd like. And then there's, apparently there's a video. Um, so if you use the QR code, there's, I think it is around the time of release if you, if you want to learn anything else about the project. But yeah. In terms of survivability, are you all feeling positively about that? Is there anybody that's seen pretty similar micro habitats? It, yeah, it, it, it looks good. It looks like they're they're moving moving pretty well. I don't uh, I haven't been in on the like there's some pretty deep sort of survivorship curve stuff that, that uh, Connor, my boss, has been has been working with. Um, we've had we've lost two turtles, but um, 
Uh, otherwise, things things have been good. So hopefully, but once again, it's only been a year, or so and they're you know a long-lived, large-body species, so nothing really happens fast with them. So I think it long term is, is a big thing, but at least in the short term, things look good. So what was done with the turtles that weren't released? Uh, as far as I know, there's still Sophie. Do you know? That I believe they're still at the hatchery. I think maybe a couple of them went to a zoo. Yeah, I think the Houston Zoo might have a few of them. I believe, but I, that was a lot of this happened before I, I showed up, so I was I unfortunately was not here for the the initial release and, and all that. So, uh, but I believe that Houston Zoo has some of them. But they're going to be released. Uh, so I'm not sure I the life cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. That was. Like growing as you believe more you mentioned one that has moved uh, moved quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So then but then you said they are not moving a lot naturally. You think they are both straight? Are they supposed to be moving? Uh I think it I think what we're seeing is pretty similar. I've I've read some some other studies in other locations, like in, in Oklahoma even, and you have these sort of periods where I mean they they'll just kind of sit on the bottom, like and we'll we'll have you know, individuals where weeks will go by and we're just in the same sort of uh, maybe 50 meter bend of the river. They're just kind of moving back and forth, you know, if, if, uh, if they're getting a lot of food and whatever. But I think once once it hits those those really resource sort of intensive times when they're looking for, looking to mate, because they're not, you know, they're not social, as far as we know at least, it's, it's kind of hard to quantify, but they're not, you know, overly social creatures. And so, they, they have to, you know, make a trek to find, and they're very cryptic, and, you know, spend a very, the majority of their time is underwater. So I'm not, so for you had mentioned that there is only a certain number of people who have called in on the heavy scene, and they, it, you'd be very unlikely, you'd be very lucky to see one, I think, in the wild, because in, even, even when they're nesting, which is really the main time that you would see them out of water, as far as we know, uh, it's it's very in close proximity. They're not usually going all the way to the wetlands like some other turtle species, like uh, common snapping turtles do. They usually you you see them on the on the road all the time because they're going to the wetlands across from it. But I don't I don't really think that that's a thing. So it's um, that was a, a really kind of roundabout answer for, for what you're asking. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I think it's it's pretty natural. What's the life I, I don't know if we know really for sure, but I'd say 80, 80 years, I think, is... Fish, fish is, fish is a big one, but it's kind of, it's, they're, it, anything fresh, they're, they're not really scavengers like some turtles could be, but, um, because once, once our bait goes bad, like, if, it, if we have a real hot day and there's no flow, and, uh, because we use fresh carp or fresh, um, buffalo or, or whatever, um, and if that goes bad, they don't want it. But I, I've looked at diet studies, and they found armadillo in in, in gut contents. They found a lot of stuff. So it's, yeah, if, yeah, if they can if they can put it in their mouth, I think they'll go for it. So, <laughs> the, in regards to the, the genetic analysis, it's mm -hmm. really interesting. So, do they get blood samples from the nugget, or I guess you do it, but do they get blood samples from? Turtles in the river at the moment, and there was pre-release. Yes, yeah. So there was there were wild turtles, and there were um, there were the, the, the repatriated turtles, and they found what they call the um, uh, like the basin level substructure. Where basically, it, the, because like I said, they're really not moving on land. But within re, uh, you know, river basins, you really have like a pretty distinct population. Um, so. You can tell very easily what, for the most part, what river drainage it came from because they all have very similar and unique sort of, uh, you know, genetics. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. They have, they have a lot of. Uh, they have a lot of. Um, yeah. I would not eat that. Um, I'll just say that. Of the two turtles lost, is that a situation where you stop eating cut or you feed off in front of the car? Uh, one was found in the. So, right? Yeah, one was found in the field and one they found in the water. Right. Mm. Mm. Who's so floating? I didn't know yeah, that. that. That the one at Toledo, there was one at Toledo that was very large. I think they had just got too big for their habitat. Mm. 
But I know that Texas Parks and Wildlife are doing a lot with alligator snapping turtles right now. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's uh, a big focus. Touched on what I was going to ask. So, mm -hmm. so, this is probably a little bit of a dumb question. I don't have any context. <laughs> so, the, the captive breeding programs, is, well, were those originally for releasing wild, I guess, releasing alligator stuff? Mm -hmm. So, what's, I guess, uh, what, are there like problems with using that approach versus repatriating? Yeah, I mean, well, I think repatriating. That sounds, I like think, or that sounds like more noble to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the thing with repatriation is you have to have a, a scenario like this where you have a bust or something like right. that, which is, is more of a blue moon scenario than a, a feasible sort of you know, thing you can do. The, the issue with captive breeding programs is oftentimes you, you want to head start an individual, like you, because you can't just take a an individual that has lived its entire life in captivity and just release it right. because they, they, they're just not prepared for that. And there have been a lot of issues with that, uh, in Texas in particular, with the, um, I mean, it's a much smaller, less complex organism, but um, uh, Texas horn lizards, they, that was a big thing with, uh, I know Dallas Zoo is a big part of it, San Antonio Zoo, um, that sort of thing. They were taking captive bred individuals releasing them, and from what they could see, they just went around in circles until they started to death. Okay. So, there has to be, and that's when they started head starting individuals and creating exclosures and, you know, and stuff like that, and that's been more effective, but that's really the big thing is kind of trying to figure out what's that sort of sweet spot for this, and um, so, yeah, I'd say Catholic Green programs are important, but I'd say they're a uh, last Resort thing, in my opinion, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to speak for any agency or anything like that. But uh, I think, generally, generally speaking, there are usually cheaper and other sort of means. And I think with with this scenario, if, if you have individuals that can be repatriated, I think it's a it's a good thing to have this information in case this with, with the amount of uh, poaching that goes on in the border. Uh, that's interesting. I, I was asking because. I come more from like the fish side, mm -hmm. and obviously like captive breeding for like salmon and stuff. Like oh that. yeah, so it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. Just, well, you also can just dump the fish in. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. No, unfortunately, they have the gall to be a bit more complex and, and, and <laughs> not handle it as well. But fortunately, things things have been going well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Fish for the individuals. Yeah. Um, anything else? Thank you all so much for letting me talk. Thank you. What was that beat you were doing? Um, Mouse is the bottom of my Next. I think that's all that we have from the presentation slide. Does anybody have anything else that they want to talk about? Are there questions they want to ask? Yeah, so they have, so they have, it's an eight that kind of goes, okay. 
down like this. So the the purpose of it, I don't know if it actually goes all the way down, but it's supposed to keep the it's more for keeping the salt water salt water floats above the, the fresh water. And so it's more designed so it kind of goes down and then it just blocks that salt water wedge from going upstream. So it's not necessarily blocking all the entire water. So uh, I guess if you did you have that fresh water going down? Yeah. But it's, uh, it's, uh, I was just thinking that they're the talking about the, the rise in the Gulf of Mexico in the last 20 years. Well, so, that is, the, is anyone addressing that? Any of the agencies? The Army Corps of Engineers and the Lower Anxious Valley Authority are the ones that operate this hot water bridge, so they're going to know a lot more about it than we do. So we just it, it, would, it would surprise me if the Army Corps of Engineers wasn't at least thinking. Stuff. Well, when I say thinking about it, I mean like, <laughs> well, that's like when they were talking about taking a million gallons out of Sam Raper, the fracking companies. And then my biggest question was is it wasn't Sam Raper that I was worried about, it was below Sam Raper that I was worried about. They do have, for most of the water permits in the state, not all of them, they do have environmental flows as part of those permits. You can't take all the water out of something. You have to have so much that still goes downstream. The saltwater barrier actually has allowed them to keep more water in Sand River because in the past they've had to release water from Sand River just to push that salt intrusion back. So when the uh, flows would get too low downstream, they would have to release water from Sand River in order to push that salt back out. And so the saltwater barrier has allowed them to keep more of that water. You Reservoir. I know in the drought of 2011, big drought that we had in 2011, the lake manager of San River at the time told me that they came very close to reaching a record low in San River. And he said they easily would have reached that record low if the saltwater barrier wasn't there. If it was keeping them from having to release as much water from San River. So, you don't want to be like me. Yeah. Luckily, we're in the west part of the state, so that helps a little bit. I know the western part of Texas controls with that a lot more. Mm -hmm. right. That concludes our meeting, right? So, like